Um, so, uh, yeah, for those who were at PyCon Singapore, I talked about uh, one of my projects there called Warp Drive. Uh, this time, I'm going to talk about another. I've got the wrong slides up. That's bad, isn't it? This is the one I did at PyCon in Singapore. I need to bring the right ones. This will teach me. Here, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> now I've probably lost this connection. Yes. Um, so yes, as, as you're saying, uh, I'm the author of Mod Whiskey, so I've been doing Python since. I don't know when to come out. Um, I, I dragged down version 0.9 off the... It wasn't internet back then, it was like Usenet news groups. Uh, so I've been playing around with Python quite a long time. Um, and I have a history of being really silly and give, putting out open source projects. And I don't know if anyone else has their own little open source projects, but they can be a lot of work and I'm silly and keep doing it. So I have three main open source projects I'm known for are ModWhiskey, um, Wrapped, and what was the other one? There's another one which died actually, I, I, a long time ago. Uh, it was a C++ class, but we weren't going to go. So anyway, I'm going to talk about RAP today. Uh, let's see if we can get this going. Good, that works. Okay, so RAP. Um, so, I started rather than going in, talk about, I'm going to talk to me about monkey patching, but I'm not going to go there quite first. I'm going to talk about um, decorators first. Now, we all know what decorators are in, in Python. Yes? They're useful? Yes? Uh, they're easy to implement. Who's implemented a decorator themselves? One, two, everyone, everyone's used them? Okay, so you've used them. So for those who have implemented them, uh, are, they, are, are they actually easy to implement? You think so? You sure? <laughs> okay, so here's a typical decorator. Um, the idea of a decorator is you're putting a wrapper around another function. Uh, and there is this syntax in, in Python where you use this at symbol to make use of the decorator. And there's a bit of magic going on here uh, to essentially put this function around this other one so that when this one is called, it'll actually call this one, do this work, and it'll return that result. So you can essentially intercept that call and put this wrapper around it. Uh, and that is the basic pattern for implementing a decorator uh, that you've probably um, used. The problem is, if you implement a decorator like that, as written, it will break things. It doesn't actually, it will work most of the time. Most people wouldn't even, wouldn't know there was a problem. But one of the things that breaks is introspection. And if you're familiar with Python, one of the great things about the language is that you can actually go in there and look at the objects that in your uh, application. So you, you fire up the interpreter and you can start playing with objects and you can work out the type of the objects, you can ask their names, you can look at help strings and so on and so on. That looking at the name, the looking at the help strings, looking at the arguments that a function accepts, that's what we regard as being introspection, it's pulling out that information to learn about it. Decorators, if you use that basic pattern, as people use, breaks it. And as the name, done score name, done score dot, that is the name and the help string that you'll get. Those things are not preserved when you wrap things with a decorator. Now, you may be familiar if you've done implementation of decorators, a package called, or module standard library called Functools. Now, it has a thing in there called WrapS. Now, it itself is a decorator. It's a bit of magic which you can supposedly use to make this decorator work properly, to fix those problems of introspection. The problem is it doesn't solve all the problems. It doesn't always work. It's sort of fixes the basic things like done score name and, and done score help a doc, but there's other things that doesn't quite get right. Now the things it doesn't fix is well there are other are still issues with introspection which it doesn't fix. Um, things like uh, the if you want to get the arguments which the the deck arguments of the function which the decorator is applied to, they don't work. You can't get them back properly. You're going to get back the arguments that the, the wrapper itself is applied. Uh, and there's other problems where if you try and use a, rep, a, a wrapper created 
using that um, uh, basic pattern of a decorator, it won't work when implementing it around certain types of other decorators which are implemented using a thing called descriptors. The descriptors is a real bit of magic in there and uh, some examples of something that uses a descriptor is class method in, in uh, uh, Python, which is another decorator. But it uses decorators. If you put one of your decorators around the class method, things start to not quite work right. So there's a lot of complicated details and I'm not going to go into it. Uh, I've done talks about this in the past and if you really want to know about all these issues that can occur with decorators and what can go wrong and how you should do them properly, if you go to my blog, it's the best place, you look on the right hand side, there's a quick link section and it has decorators and monkey patching. There's about a dozen or so blog posts there where I've talked about and gone through uh, the basics of decorators, of how they're implemented, why they're implemented wrong, how they should be implemented and so on and so on. So you want to know more about that, then go there. So much as you might think decorators simply, if you're going to implement, this is my advice, don't try and do them yourself. Okay? Don't follow that pattern that I showed up there earlier. But what is the solution? The solution is a project I wrote called RAT. Uh, what it does is it embodies all that proper way of doing things. So it deals with all those things about introspection. It, it deals with the things of how to create a decorator which when applied around another sort of decorator, whether it's a normal decorator or one implemented using a scripter, it handles all that magic and does everything correctly. All the introspection things are fixed. You can query your decorated function and you'll get back the correct name, the correct doc string, the correct arguments, and a whole host of other things. In terms of using RAP to create your own decorator, then it's a bit simpler than we had before. Before we were implementing the decorator by using a function closure, essentially one function is nested inside of another. Using this decorator from RAP to declare it, you get rid of one level there, which makes it all look a bit simpler. Uh, and you're gonna just declare your wrapper function as like that and you'll get a few arguments come in. Wrap, which is the function you decorated, and then up the end you've got args and kwrs. And there's this other thing in here called instance. Now what's interesting about instance, if I go the right way, is that when you use the original decorator pattern, one of the things, that, bits of information and knowledge that you lose, that you don't know about, is whether you've applied a decorator to a normal function, or a, a instance method of a class, or a class method, uh, or even to a class. That information is very hard to get out and use that basic decorator pattern. In RAPT, it allows you to get that out such that when your wrapper function is called, it will can tell you effectively by this instance argument how your decorator was being used. So we can see whether the decorator is being applied to a class, to a functional static method, to a class method, or an instance method. Now that's very important because if you want to write a decorator which can be used in different scenarios like that and has, is able to dynamically adjust, you need something like that. And who uses Django? No, you use Django? There are decorators in Django which, uh, there are two versions of them. One you can apply to a normal function and then the same type of decorator but you have to use a different one of applying it to an instance method because they haven't um, got that smarts in there to allow their decorator implementation to pick up in what context it's used in. Wrapped is wrapped handle set and that's the thing I say you be able to create these things called universal decorators. Now most of the time a lot of people might not need this but it's a cute feature. Now, if you don't trust me in, in, in believing me and say you should use Wrapped and it's wonderful and all that, I had multiple people from the core developers of Python come up to me. Can you please get Wrapped inside of the Python standard library? Okay, so I think the last one was, um, ah, I've forgotten his first name, someone Hastings. Um, Anyway, very, very important person in the C Python world, and I've totally forgotten his name. <laughs> um, whether we'll get into the standard library, I don't know. I've missed the cutoff for Python 2.6. 
Um, I've got a year and a half, I think, apart from to see maybe I'll, I'll get enthusiastic and, and look at it. Now, I've talked about wrapped and decorators, but and it's really good for that. That actually wasn't what wrapped was created for. The reason that wrap was created was for something called monkey patching. I used to work at a company called New Relic. Anyone heard of New Relic? They do application performance monitoring for web applications. And they, what they do is they provide agent library, if you like, call it their agent package, which integrates into a web application to put in instrumentation which allows you then to monitor that web application. So the number of requests coming in, how long the requests take, but a lot, lot deeper than that. Uh, if you are using Django, for example, it will associate a particular request with the particular view handler in Django, which was invoked to handle that request. So it will associate that data for that request with that view handler. And that way you can get a breakdown of not my web app's getting all these requests, but my web app's getting all these requests, and I know that 50% of them went to this particular view handler, and 25% to this handler. And it can dig down into extracting data out about uh, database performance. How many calls you're doing to your database for S um, SQL database? Uh, how long each of those queries took? What were the details of the queries? Now, to do all that, if you're going to instrument your own code, you may well go off and use your own decorator. You, you've got the ability to modify your code, put those decorators in there where you need them to extract information out and then report it into a, a monitoring system um, such as uh, Datadog, StatsD, um, I can't remember, a couple of others as well. Uh, or there's a lot of open source ones as well. Uh, so you can do it all manually, but when you talk about a product like New Relic, uh, they don't really want you to expect you to go and put all of this instrumentation in your, your own code yourself to do all of that. So what New Relic does is goes in and monkey patches the hell out of the code base. Um, it knows about Django or Pyramid or whatever other release of frameworks. It will detect when you have imported those modules. And so when you import Django, great you're using Django, I'm going to go in and put all this monkey patching in there to instrument so I know when this view handler is called, when this template rendering is happening. Uh, and it does all that, all that dynamically without you even knowing. And if you were using uh, New Relic and you thought, hey, this is a lot of magic, if you had no idea how it uh, works, you should be really scared. <laughs> so when I was at New Relic, I, I wrote that Python agent for them. And and yeah, it monkey patches the hell out of everything. And in doing that, um, we'd, I'd done all that monkey patch coding for them. As, as, but I sort of like thought, I thought one holiday, I was actually up in KL, because I've just come back from a holiday from KL. I was actually in KL one holiday before, a number of years ago. I think it was, uh, it might have been a five or six week holiday at that time. I can't remember. Um, and I thought, okay, I've learned all this stuff about how to do monkey patching because of New Relic. And I thought, okay, it's time to sit down and do it properly now. And I did it as a separate library, which is what wrapped us. And so that's what it all came from, from that work from there. Um, so why then is wrap got decorators in there, but also monkey patch? And, and that is because decorators rely on a lot of the similar principles to monkey patching. So I actually did the monkey patching support and the art side effect of that was this great way of implementing decorator really easy as well. Uh, so that's how it came about. Now the reason for that, who, it, who has used Python 2.3 or earlier? Anyone use Python from that far back? Wow. Okay. So Python 2.3 and earlier did not have decorator syntax. This didn't exist. Okay? You could still do the same thing, but the way you would write it in your code and you just have to remember that we had that function wrapper implementation before. So if you're using 2.4 plus, you can just go at name of decorator applied to function. In Python 2.3, you get your function and you're going to go function equals, so we're going to actually replace this with a function wrapper passing it the function. And so if you remember the implementation of the nested, nested function, so you've called that outer function 
which has passed in the function as an argument, and the body of that has then returned the inner function, the closure, function closure. And that's what actually gets assigned back into that. Uh, so this is what generally we refer to as being monkey patching. Um, and that's how decorators effectively are implemented under the hood. The difference is decorators are applied when your code is defined. So if you've written your own code, uh, be it a function at a module scope, what you're doing, you go in there, you put your code in there, you put at function wrapper. Or if you define in your class, it's at function wrapper on the instance method. And that decorator is applied when that Python code is being read in by the interpreter and convert, co converted from code to byte code. Okay? So it's, it is done when the code is defined. The difference with monkey patching is it's performed after the fact. And as a result, it can't use the decorator syntax. Now, what I mean by after the fact, it's literally going to be after that mo whole module has been imported. Okay, sometime later. Why would you want to monkey patch? Uh, you may want to monkey patch if you need to fix bugs in code that you cannot modify. So imagine Django had a bug in it, uh, and yeah, they know about it, they've fixed it, uh, it's not going to be available until Python 1.10, which is just going through pre-release uh, candidates at the moment. But imagine you were on version 1.8 of Django, and you couldn't move up for various reasons. But you still need that fix. Now, you've got the choice of fork Django, make your own modified version of it, and then maintain that. Alternatively, you can use your existing Django 1.8 and use monkey patching to go in there and apply a fix to that code after the fact. Uh, so that's one reason you might use it. Uh, another, another reason you might use it, and probably the, 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 re the, way, the, the use case which most people would encounter it, is for doing testing. Now, who here has used the mock package? Anyone heard of mock? One again, same person. <laughs> uh, uh, if you're using Python 3, I, I can't remember what it's called. There is a version of mock now in one of the more recent Python 3 versions. What mock is, is if you're writing unit tests for Python code, it's a way of, when you're writing those unit tests, you, it's, you, don't, you want to isolate bits of the code you're testing so that you can test just those bits a bit at a time. And when you've got a large application, which may be doing things like calling out to some back-end service, and you want to just test the function which is doing that call and processing the result, you don't want it to be talking to that back-end service, because that back-end service may not exist. So there's this library out here called Mock, um, and this again shows how bad my memory is. I forgot the name of the guy who writes it. He's a UK person. He's got a big beard. Um, I have met him in New Zealand. Um, and he wrote this thing called Mock, and it's a way of doing monkey patching effectively. So you write your unit test, and you apply decorators to your unit test, and with a description of what I need to monkey patch for that unit test. And so when that unit test runs, it'll go and apply all these monkey patches uh, to change the code. So it might stub out some code. So rather than actually making a call to um, request library and then doing a call to back out service, you'll mock out parts of the request library so that the call will actually go to your mock code. So instead of calling backers, it'll call you a little test function or mock function, which returns it a faked up result. So that's another use for it. And finally, I mentioned the case of Neuralink before. You might want to do it to go into code and add instrumentation to be able to do performance monitoring as well. So monkey patching with React. Uh, give you an example. Uh, so you remember this function we had before, the wrapper, and I previously I was having at wrap.decorator to create a decorator. I'm, I'm dropping that decorator at the moment. So imagine I've got this bit of code here in this example.py. And I want to apply a wrapper around this name method in there because I need to change the implementation slightly uh, to do something to fix a bug or it might be mocking it out to do testing. Uh, 
What you can do with wrapped is essentially you've got this patches module, you can import wrapped, define the wrapper, import the uh, class from that code file that I want to actually apply this wrap to. I'm just going to say wrap dot wrap function, name of class, we're actually going to give it the class object, the name of the method, and the wrapper. And wrapped is going to go in there and put a wrapper around that method. And it's going to do that. If you then go and create an instance of that example class now, and call name on that, in, on that method, it's going to call in here, which then allows you to do something. And in this case, I'm just calling the original. But I could change arguments as they go in. I could get the results as it comes out and change the result. Or I could just not even call it and just stub it out with a, a mock value for testing. And that's all it does. Um, but you'll see the separation here which I mentioned before about decorators do with the defined monkey patterns after the fact, I've already imported this, this module there. So I'm going and doing evil things afterwards. Now, when I showed the how things were done in 23, you might remember I had an example there, <coughs> function equals wrapper function. You shouldn't do that, actually. <laughs> um, that itself can cause various strange corner case problems uh, with classes, class methods, class instance methods in particular. Uh, so you could do that. So I've got my wrap decorator example again. So that's my decorator version. You can do this, and it'll work 99% of the time. But there's some corner cases that uh, it won't work in. So that's where, when you're using wrap, you always use my function. Trust that wrap will go in and do the things that it needs to do properly. Uh, and I don't know how familiar you are with. Um, how the, the Python object model works. Um, everyone familiar with how in the Python module, in a Python class, there is a dict, underscore dict. That's where all the attributes are, the methods from that type are in there. Uh, if we do this, yeah, great. We're, we're getting the, they're getting that function out of there, but there's this magic thing that happens with Python called binding. Uh, usually, it's used to take a, the normal function and associate it with an instance of a class. Um, that's where things start to fall apart if you try and do this yourself, because we've gotten this off the class type itself. Binding has occurred. It's actually bound that function to a none, whereas normally. Uh, when you're using an instance, it'll be bound to an instance. Uh, anyway, I'll, 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 I'll just confuse everyone and myself if I go into that. Just trust me, don't do that. That's why I've got the other function. So direct patching of methods breaks in certain corner cases, and basically if you're going to use wrapped, you'd let wrapped do it for you. Now, you remember there where we had examples.py and we had my patches file, and I had to actually import that example class from the examples.py. We can actually clean that up a bit by having a decorator even. So in this case, I've got my wrapper function, and I've got this other decorator inside of wrapped, which is patch function wrapper. So in this case, rather than going in, I import from example, uh, import example from, I think it, import example from example. Okay. I should have used a different name, shouldn't I? Anyway, instead of importing the module and, and getting the class out of it, uh, we can just say, Wrap, patch this function wrapper um, in module example and the method example dot name. Okay. When I import patches dot pi, it'll zip through this, it'll see this, it'll apply that wrapper, and it's all done. Okay, we can clean that up a bit. Um, now, I mentioned testing before. So, what about testing where we do not want permanent patches? Because that that previous example, patch function wrapper, it's a permanent. Thing. It's once you do that, it's applied forever for the life of that process. So, wrapped has this other one then, which is transient function wrapper. It's very very similar to that patch function wrapper. Uh, but what we're going to do in this case is, when this file gets uh, pulled in, it's not actually going to do anything at this point. It's actually going to create a new decorator, and we're going to create use that new decorator down here. So what, and it's applied it to this test method here. What's going to happen in this case is that when we call test method, what will happen is that this is when this kicks in, 
it will apply that wrapper to that method, lookup method on that class, and then it will call test method, actually the body of it. So when it calls this method body here, that wrapper will be exist, do whatever we need to do, and when it pops out of this function, it's going to remove that wrapper. And the reason for this is if you've got a whole bunch of test methods, uh, and mock library, uh, mock package works the same way. You can't have the patches be permanent because you may want different patches applied for different testers. tests. So you run one test with one particular monkey patches applied. When that test is finished, you take them all out. Then you run the next test with a different set of monkey patches applied. And that way you keep all the things separate when you, you're running the different tests. Anyway, there's a way, way in Rapid doing that. Uh, also, RAP has another case of what if we need to intercept access to a single instance of an object? Okay, so let's see if we can give an example of that. Um, imagine that we have just ignore this bit here for a second. So imagine our test method is going storage equals instance of storage class. And then it calls storage lookup key. So normally what would happen is we create our instance, we go and, and, and do that. Uh, now in this particular case, we've created this, that storage instance within the scope of this method. So it doesn't matter, it's a local copy. But you can imagine that uh, when we monkey patch something, we're actually monkey patching a method on the type of the class. So every single instance we create of that class that we've monkey patched has that monkey patch code applied to it. So we only want to have a monkey patch applied to one instance, because we might be doing this in, in instrumentation in a real life function, real life application, and it might be a multi-threaded application. And so there are all these different threads running all over the place. And we only may want to patch one instance of a class in one thread. We don't want that same monkey patch to be affecting everything else. Now, what Rapt has for that is this thing called an object proxy. Uh, it's the thing that actually underlies everything in Wrapped. Everything is built around this wrap, this object proxy. All the monkey patching function wrappers are built on object proxy. Decorator implementation is built on this object proxy. What it is, it's a way of just essentially giving it any Python object. You wrap this object proxy around it. And if I now call the proxy, what will actually happen is it will just forward on that call to the original method on the original storage class, the original lookup method. Uh, but if I go put my wrapper around it, my, my proxy wrapper, I, it allows me to intercept that one method call. And so when I call, in this case, storage lookup with this part, it's actually going to call my method here, and I can do what I say and call the original one. This is the original object I wrapped here. But if I call storage.clear, I did not define clear in here, it will still call the original straight. Mm -hmm. So essentially, what's called, what's called a transfer object proxy, uh, it works not just on method calls. If you access an attribute via the proxy, it'll give you back the one that's in the original one. Uh, if you've ever used, um, from the Python standard library from weak ref module, there is a type in there called ref. It is another form of object proxy. Uh, uh, the it, it though is um, not transparent in the sense that when you want to access it, you actually have to use ref and like a call to get back the original. Um, this one just does all, does all transparent. Um, so there are the different ways of you can use wrap to do this and front monkey patching uh, if you need to. Now, very important thing. You mentioned before about how decorators are applied when the code is being read in. Monkey patch is done after the fact. One thing you very have to be very, very careful of is ordering problems when you apply monkey patches. And here's an example. I have a function in an example code file, that's the original one, and I want to monkey patch that. So that gets imported by module.py, somewhere else in the application code base. And it might go from example import function. I later want to try and patch this function. And I go, oh yeah, great, I have my wrap fun patch function wrapper and I'll apply a wrap around it. There's a problem. Anyone see what the problem is? So the module wrapper is still not patched. 
In audio dot pi, it's still the amplifier. Correct. Function. So I'm going to apply this to here. But this, because it went from example import function, has copied a reference of function into the global namespace of module. So when I patch this, it's only patching this. It's not patching this function. So that's what I mean by ordering problems. If, if other things get in there before you do and import that module and do things like this, then your monkey patch doesn't apply to their copies of it. And if you have ever used eventlet or g event, um, if you, they, the purpose of event g event, there are packages in, in Python um, which, not in the core, but third party, which rather than using threading, multi threading to implement concurrency, they use a thing called greenlets. Uh, essentially, it's, it's um, cooperative multitasking. It relies on something that is running to say, okay, I'm going to block here, I'm going to voluntarily give up control so that something else can run. To do that though, so it's transparent, those packages go in and monkey patch the sta Python standard library. They go in and monkey patch into the socket code, um, multi-threading code, a whole bunch of other places. The way that they work is this naive approach of you in your application, you, there's a particular function in a, a G event where you have to go G event dot monkey patch all. That has to eventually get done. It goes to all these all these monkey patches get applied. But if the application code has already imported some of the stuff that uh, it needs to monkey patch, you'll end up with a copy, and your copy won't be imported. And and Gvent and Event themselves have got tripped up by this uh, because in the Python standard library themselves, uh, a lot of code around there which goes from time import sleep. Um, and things will get copies of sleep. Uh, when you use these packages, there'll be some sleep call out that doesn't work and it blocks your whole function because it hasn't got this little wrapper around it which says, no, I'm going to give up control so something else can run while I sleep. Uh, I, I don't like Gvent and Eventlet. Um, if you ever think you have a need for them, uh, probably you don't. Um, don't use them unless you really, really understand how they work and you think you have a need for them uh, because they don't do monkey patching properly. Uh, another problem I want to concur is the fact that in that previous code, I've got this patches module. So you might have in your application code, okay, I want to do all this different monkey patching. But imagine if you've got different ways of running your application. In some cases, it may not only exercise certain function, functionality. So you only may import certain code. But if I have a whole bunch of these patches that are being applied in one big patches file, and it's going to import all of this code that it wants to monkey patch uh, up front. If you never use that code later on, you've imported it for no reason. All you've done is increase the amount of memory your, your application is using. Uh, so that's another danger thing you have to be careful of. So what can we do about it? Uh, everyone familiar with what PEPs are? So PEP, PEP is what's called a Python Enhancement Proposal. Uh, if you're familiar with the internet, they have RFCs, Request for Comments. PEP is like the Python equivalent of that. It's where someone can write up a proposal about how something should be implemented and down the track if it's accepted, it, it may be implemented into the core Python library or the language and so on. Now there was this PEP, in, PEP created called PEP 369, which is post portals. Uh, it never got implemented, never got accepted, never, so it, it doesn't exist, it never, it never got done. Uh, but Rapt has implemented a part of that. Uh, actually, it has implemented all of it. Um, now, memory for my patches module was going to actually cause examples to be imported straight away. Uh, using concepts from these post import hooks, I'm going to go in here, I've got my wrapper, uh, and I've got my, my function apply patches, which is fingers actually going to apply that patch. But I've put around it a decorator which is wrapped when imported. So example. So all this is a definition. And what happens is that you import that and it hasn't caused example to be implemented to be imported at that point. But if example is imported later on by something, 
I've installed this thing called this post import hook. So when that module is imported later, it'll go, great, I've seen that that module has been imported now. I'm going to call this function and allow you to apply that patch. Only at the point that the module was actually imported. And very, very importantly, it is applied before anything else gets to do anything with the module. Uh, so if the first user of that module was, from example, import function, or example class, this gets in before that happens. So I can actually apply my patch before anything else. Very important. Um, now that is better, but it still requires that patches module to be imported before anything else in your main application script. So you still have to go in to modify your application. And we've got it down now to um, a little bit of code modification, but it's still got to go and modify your application code. What would be great is if you didn't have to modify anything in your application code. And there's a way of doing that. So we need a way to trigger monkey patches without modifying the application code. And I have another package for that. It's called auto wrapped. Uh, so people install auto wrapped as well. Now, for this to work, what we need to do though is we need to separate each of your sets of monkey patches into their own separate modules. Uh, now, I'm going to use an example here. Uh, in the Python standard library, there's this module called WSGIREF. So WSGI is the Python standard for interfacing with web applications between servers and applications. Uh, and there's this simple whiskey server in there. Now I want to instrument that whiskey server so that when I get a HTTP request in my application, I want to dump it how long that, that web request took. So I'm going to go and create this separate module now which packages up my monkey patches. So I've got a setup.py file here, which is what you use if you want to create your own installable Python module, which you want to put up on PyPy and let people install and so on. So it's called, uh, I'm going to call, call my module name wrapped, please give ref to plug in. Uh, very important here, I've got this thing in here called entry point. This is something which is a part of this package called setup tools. Uh, originally when Python came around there was a thing called dist utils. It was the basic library and package which you used when, when implementing these setup.pies to create installable modules. Uh, someone created something a bit more complicated and, uh, called setup tools and one of these things that he had was this thing called entry points. It's just a way of when you install a module, it can register the, these things called entry points. Uh, it just creates a, a, a file in your Python installation associated with that package. Say, so here's this extra bit of information. This, this module provides this service or this functionality or something like that. And you can go and look up those entry points later. Um, and we're gonna make use of that. And so this may look complex. It's gonna be the actual monkey patch module. Uh, it's similar to before, uh, and actually I should point out something about my entry point. Yeah, so my, this is the details of my entry point. What I'm saying is when server module is imported, I want you to call rack ref debugging, which is the name of my module, apply patches. And here's that method, apply patches is here. And I'm just going to say patching module, and I'm going to wrap the function wrapper with that using that function from wrap. The actual, what it's going to do is it's going to take whiskey request handler handle, which is the actual handle function within inside the whiskey service implementation, which handles one request. And I'm going to wrap it with this function called timed function. So timed function, again following the wrap way of doing decorated, is going to start a timer, print out that we started it call the original function, and when it's done, we're just going to print out its finished. So we're applying the monkey patch. Now here's the magic with auto wrapped. I'm going to go pip install auto wrapped. I've gone pip install my monkey patch module. And I have an app.py, which is my application. And that's importing that simple server from WSGIREF module and giving it a WSGI application to run. That's your original code. I am not touching that at all. Right, we're not going to modify it. All we need to do, because I've installed auto wrap, is set this environment variable. This is the name of my module, which includes monkey patch. Exporting it so that the application is here. And I'm going to run Python. Just Python, nothing else. Python app.py. 
and my code got patched in automatically. And I made a web request, started the handle, finished it, give me the time. I haven't modified one line of code in the application that I wanted to change. All very magic. Um, and I don't actually tell you. Uh, how that works is, is very evil. Um, I, the auto wrap module has been around over a year. This is the first time I've told anyone about it, even though it's been up on, on um, actually no, I did do a blog post about it. Uh, it's not something I said much about because I'm not sure what the reaction will be to people. Um, there's this really weird concept in, in Python packages. When you install a Python package into your Python distribution, one of the things that it can install into the Python installation into the site packages directory, which is where all your modules are installed, along with the package, you can install this, this file, which called, I call a pf file, but .pth. Uh, the, it's like, the original purpose of it was that uh, you can almost view it like a, a symlink or an alias, if you like. It would normally have in it a, a directory. So what would happen is when Python starts up and trying to work out your sys.path, which is where it's going to get all your modules from, it goes through the directories and looks for all these .pth files. It will open it up, get the name of that directory out of it, and stick that in sys.path. So it was a way of having packages installed elsewhere rather than just the site packages directory, and Python would know where to get packages from from those. Uh, the main use of it is not actually to have packages installed somewhere else. It was so that when you install a package, you can have a version number. And the directory, that would be in actually in a subdirectory of the site packages. So you might have Django dash 1.10 in a subdirectory. Um, but there will also be a Django.pth file which says Django dash 1.10. So that way it knows. When it goes through sys.pth, it'll put site packages Django 1.10 in sys.path, so it knows where to find that actual version of Django. That's where it came from. Somewhere along the line, and I believe it had something to do with um, codex for uh, language locales, um, someone had this really weird idea that, hey, let's allow executable code inside of that .pth file. And there's this bit of magic in there. That Python, when going through looking at all those .pth files, if it starts with import space, it's going to go, oh, this is code. I'm actually going to read in that line of code and execute it when Python is being initialized. So Autoraptor is doing this horrible bit of magic, which puts code in one of these .pth files. When Python starts up, uh, it's, that bit of code is going to, is that environment variable set for Autorapt bootstrap? If it is, I'm going to import auto wrapped. I'm going to call this bootstrap function, which then goes in hooks into the Python import machinery for modules. And that gives me my way in then of uh, hooking into the import mechanism so that um, you've told it this is this monkey patch module over here. I've been able to use those entry points to get the information about where that monkey patch function is. And that all gets registered. And later on, when your code imports that WSGIF simple server module, my code will go, oh good, I'm going to monkey touch it for you, before anyone even gets to it. It's really, really horrible and nasty, but it works. And the interesting thing I find about this is that, and it's maybe a weird concept um, for many, I think, is that it means that technically, because of the way all this works, I've had to package up my monkey patch as a module. You can start to distribute monkey patches as packages on PyPy. And the, the use case of this for me is instrumentation for monitoring. Now, back in New Relic, when I did that, that was obviously required for a bit of software. And all of the monkey pattern required for all the different frameworks uh, that existed, the database modules and all this sort of thing, we at New Relic had to implement all those and they were part of the New Relic package. And, you know, it's not really extensible by anyone else because it's all New Relic stuff. But technically, if one wanted, uh, one could go and uh, write, your, uh, write a, a replacement for New Relic, if you like, uh, which has a basic bit of functionality in there for handling the reporting of metrics pipeline into some backend. 
And through just using this, this ability to package up monkey patches, people could come along and, and start packaging up instrumentation for all these different frameworks themselves and just put them on Python. And if someone knew about it, then they could say, great, I'll bring in my base monitoring package and oh, I need this bit of monkey patching for Django and this bit of monkey patching for this and just list them in that environment for able to just patch and they don't need to modify their code at all. And they can have a, get a whole ecosystem of all, all these horrible monkey patches. Um, that's a scary idea, but I don't know whether I'll get people interested in that. The last thing about wrapped. Um, so I had decorator support, had all this stuff with monkey patching. Um, it has one bonus feature. If you're doing multi-thread programming, um, I've thrown in a example, if you like, an example of, of a decorator in there. Um, actually, I wanted to use it myself. Uh, if you've done multi-thread programming, you would know that you have to be careful about doing thread synchronization. Um, and you know you need to make sure that if you've got shared data, that you don't have multiple things accessing the same data at the same time. Uh, and normally you would use the, the lock object in the threading module yourself to do that. Uh, and that gets a bit complicated and things like that. But there's a much simpler way. If one can actually incorporate that manipulation of the lock, of the acquire of the lock and the release of the lock around the, the function which is modifying the data in a decorator, you can make it really simple. You can have at synchronous. So in this particular case, it means that if multiple threads call this function at the same time, only one can execute the code at the same time. And this one is separated. If it's got its own, it's got its own synchronization lock on it. Um, and who has used Java? Anyone? OK. You're familiar with the synchronized, uh, what are they called? They're not decorators. What are they called? Annotation. Annotation, is it? You're familiar with the syn synchronized annotation in, in it's Java? A keyword. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so in Java has this idea of synchronized keyword, and it's very similar to decorators in the way we use them, right? But there's a very, very important thing. Uh, when you use synchronized keyword on a method of a class in Java, it's effectively locking that whole instance of that class, okay? Uh, or if the synchronized decorator, does Java have static methods now? Yes. Okay. I think if you apply the synchronized to the static function, it's locking, I guess, the whole class. Uh, I don't know about the instance, it's probably not a static class. Anyway, if you remember back to my description of the wrap decorator before, we talked about the universal direct decorator. Uh, the fact that the decorator could tell whether you're applying it to normal function, instance method, or class, or class method. We can make use of that inside of this synchronized decorator implementation. So in this particular case, we had synchronized on the function before, and all it's doing is controlling access to that one function, global function. People are synchronized on a method now, because I know that I'm being using it on an instance method of the class, hey, I can lock the instance of the class. Or if I apply it to a class method, class method normally only apply to a class, I can lock the class. Uh, if I apply it to a static method, Static methods aren't really bound, they're like just a global function, then I'm just locking that one function. Um, but also in Java, I can't remember how the synchronized for this works. There's some, there's some, dec there's some um, syntax for this in, in, in Java as well. If you want to be able to synchronize on a block of code, uh, my synchronized decorator, even though it's a decorator, I've made it a bit more magic as well, and I've turned it into a context manager. And uh, if you don't know what context managers are, they are the things that you use with this with syntax. You might be familiar with the, the, if you've gone with open file name. That gives back a file object, but that with statement ensures that that is closed when that with statement exits. And that's the fact because this file object is what's called a, uh, implemented as what's called a context manager. So I've made my decorator even more fancy, I've made it multi purpose. It's not, it's, not, it's, just, it's not just a decorator, it's also a context manager. So as well as, as using it as a decorator, we can actually use it in this. So we've got a decorator, we can also at the same time do this. And it's smart enough that in this case it's, it's an instance method, so it's synchronizing on the instance. And here I can say we've synchronized self. And so I can say again on the on the instance. Uh, or if it's a 
Uh, another ETH method I, I, for some reason, needed to synchronize on the class, so similar to a class method, I could actually give it the object type instead. And I'll synchronize on that instead. So that's my extra bonus thing in Wrapped. Um, so why well, might you use one of these, use Wrapped then? For creating better decorators? Um, I, I don't say that I got it 100% right, but I'm a lot, lot closer than using functools.wrappers. A lot, lot closer. Uh, and there's a lot of code in there. There is a pure Python version, but there's also C implementations for the performance. So it'll use the C implementation uh, and, and make it nice and performant, and it will fall back to, to pure Python for some reason. You're going to follow the. I've got safe mecha mechanism for monkey patching, uh, and you get this brilliant little synchronization wrapper uh, decorated. And that's it. That's, that's my talk. Uh, so, what docs there is, wrap doc, read the docs.io, uh, but better still go to my blog, go look on the right hand side, and there's that quick link for monkey patching. Now, decorators monkey patching, where there's that over a dozen blog posts on the, the topic. Actually, I think they're linked off off there somewhere as well. Uh, so that's one of my little open source projects. Um, and that's it. So any questions? Um, the code, that sample code that you went through, is that available on the blog site? Or um, is this presentation available? I, I can, I'll, I'll be putting it up. It'll end up on um, with a slideshow probably. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I usually put stuff off. I think it's up on slideshow. There's, there's, there's two slide sites. I can't remember which one I use. Um, uh, but the blog posts, that over a dozen blog posts, go into a lot more detail. This they've got all these examples in there and more. How long have you been using Python? Uh, as I said, I downloaded version 0.9. Okay. I, I looked at it and went, oh crap, tabs, uh, spaces is as, yeah, as yeah, indenting yeah. as like, you gotta be joking. <laughs> I, I sort of played around a little bit, but obviously it was very early then. Yeah. And I, I think I next dealt with it when it was about version 1.2. One dot one, one two, maybe one dot three, um, and I started playing with it more then. And I wrote all these big Python wrappers around uh, my C plus plus library, which I had out then. And that C plus plus library that started in about nineteen ninety before Python S, uh, before the C plus plus standard template library existed. So it had string classes, it had collection classes, it had. Um, uh, an old templify, there was a logging system in there, there was an event system, there was a distributed messaging system in there, and I used, created Python wrappers for the distributed messaging system, so I had a whole way of doing distributed applications using a publish subscriber request for file module, and that was used in some uh, telco software where I was working, and uh, a later job where I was, um, uh, of all things, writing software to drive card printers to print driver's licenses. <laughs> Uh, that software is still used, it's still running. It's, it's, uh, even though I don't have any play with that C library for many years, it's still running. Um, any yeah. other questions? Yeah, any last few questions, please? Okay, one last slide after this. Um, for those who weren't at PyCon Singapore, I did a talk on a thing called Warp Drive. Uh, and that is to do with web application deployment. Uh, and, and Docker, trying to make web applications are much, much easier to deploy. Um, and one of the, it's not just local, you, uh, Warp Drive is designed to do stuff, very, make very, very things very, very easy on your local development system, um, but also inside of Docker, but also in hosting services such as OpenShift, which is where I work, which I'm the advocate for. But I'm now I, an author, I don't, I don't know my name on a book now. This book is free. If you're interested in platform as a service, web if you need to host a web application, uh, then you can go and download this book for free and it will uh, tell you about how OpenShift works, our latest version, which is using Docker for container runtime. 
Kubernetes for orchestration and scheduling, because uh, Docker alone, it's great on your own machine, but if you need to start going uh, beyond one machine into many, many machines, uh, Docker alone is not there. Docker is Inc., the company, is trying to fill in all the holes to make a their Docker cloud or what do they call Docker data center. They are still a long way behind things like Kubernetes, uh, Mesos, and all these other, other ones, but we use thing called Kubernetes. So if you're all interested in web application hosting uh, or Python web apps, go look at that. That book mentions Java, though, unfortunately. It only mentions Python once in the whole book. But you can download it for free. It'll explain how you can actually download a VM and run OpenShift on your own laptop and play with it. Um, I do actually have, in that VM you download, there are actually are some templates in there for deploying Python web apps using my warp drive software, which is what my other talk was about. Um, and obviously there's a video from the PyCon Singapore that talk if you're interested can go back and look at it. Otherwise you can come to PyCon Australia in a few weeks time and see it there because I'm going to give a talk again. Okay? All right. Thank you, Greg. Okay.